Hi, my name is Virginia Sykes. I'm the Variety Testing Coordinator and Agroecology Specialist at the University of Tennessee. And today I'm going to be talking to you about our cover crop variety trial. Now this is actually part two of our cover crop variety trial presentations. The first was given at the virtual Milan no-till field day, and that's still available at this link here. And there we covered results for biomass, cover, and height. Today we're going to focus primarily on our latest results that pertain to nitrogen. This information can also be found as a downloadable PDF or Excel files at search.utcrops.com backslash cover crops. So we're going to start off with a brief overview of cover crops. Cover crops are simply any plant that's grown off season from our cash crops. So in Tennessee, most of our agricultural production systems are going to be warm season annuals. So most of our cover crops are cool season annuals. Things like wheat, cereal rye, crimson clover, hairy vetch, winter pea, all of these are very common in Tennessee. Now cover crops provide many benefits to an agricultural production system. Some of these benefits are long-term, things that are going to improve the soil and help build resilience in that system to extreme weather events, things like drought or flooding. They can also help with providing beneficial insect habitat, something that's very important for the long-term success of agriculture. Now, cover crops also have some short-term benefits that can provide economic advantage and are also very important in an organic system where some of our options are limited for things like weed suppression or providing nutrients to the system. So today we're going to focus primarily on that nutrient content and specifically on nitrogen. Now cover crops can provide nitrogen to a cash crop system and as you can see from this graph they can provide quite a bit of nitrogen. So this is from the University of Georgia and it shows how much nitrogen each of these species provided, as well as the range. And right here you can see you know, crimson clover providing on average about 75 pounds per acre of nitrogen. Hairy vetch, even more than that, 125 pounds per acre. That's quite a lot of nitrogen, but what's really important to focus on are those bars. So that shows the range of nitrogen that these cover crops provided. So while on average that crimson clover might have been providing 75 pounds per acre, that range went from zero to over 250 pounds per acre. So why do we see such a wide range even within a species? Well, there are differences in regional adaptation of varieties within a species. So some species and some varieties within those species are going to perform better and have higher biomass potential in certain regions. Other factors can include when that cover crop is planted and when it's terminated, as well as what growth stage it's terminated at. Environment can also have a very big impact on nitrogen release from cover crops. So things like whether we're leaving that biomass on the surface or tilling it in, what type of soil we have, as well as weather, precipitation and temperature, both having a big impact on the rate of decomposition of these cover crop species, which directly impacts when you're going to get that nitrogen. And what happens if you make assumptions about nitrogen that are incorrect? Well, you can end up with a cash crop that's not getting as much nitrogen as it needs and that can result in significant yield reductions. Now picking the right cover crop for your system used to be pretty simple because there weren't a lot of options. But as cover cropping has increased in practice, we have seen an increase in the number of varieties that are available. And a lot of these are adapted to specific regions. So this is great in that now you have a lot more choices and some that may do better in your system, but it also makes it a little tricky because how do you know which one is going to work best for you? 
So this is why we implemented our cover crop variety trial, which was planted last fall. We had 60 entries, and these fell into the three major functional groups of cover crops, cereals, legumes, and brassicas. And then within those larger groups, we had various species. So within the cereal, annual ryegrass, barley, cereal rye, oats, and wheat. Within our legumes, we had balanza, bursim, crimson, and red clover, as well as common, hairy, and woolly pod vetch, and winter pea. And then within the brassicas, we had collards, a hybrid brassica, radish, and turnip. And so within each of these species, we further broke that down into varieties. So you can see some species were better represented, and these were the ones that are more commonly used in Tennessee, things like cereal rye. We also had quite a few entries in the barley. Crimson clover, hairy vetch, winter pea. These are all very common cover crop species in Tennessee, so it wasn't surprising to see more varieties among those species. This trial was planted at three Tennessee locations, Knoxville in East Tennessee, Spring Hill in Middle Tennessee, and Milan over in West Tennessee. It was set up as a randomized complete block design with three replications at these three locations. The cover crops were planted in the fall of 2019 in early to mid-October, and these were drilled at the appropriate depth for each species. Our plots were between five foot and seven foot, five foot at our East Tennessee and Middle Tennessee location, and seven foot wide at our Milan location, and 30 foot long. We measured percent cover, height, biomass, nitrogen content in that biomass, and estimated nitrogen release from that biomass. And as I said before, today we're going to be talking primarily about nitrogen release. But if you'd like more information about those previous traits, those are available at that Milan no-till presentation. All right, so first of all, our biomass was measured using a sample of a 15 inch by 15 inch square. All of the biomass was cut to one inch from the soil surface, and that biomass was dried at 65 degrees Fahrenheit to a constant weight. This was measured in the 1st of April and the 1st of May. And these two termination timings were chosen because we were looking specifically at corn and soybean systems, where prior to corn, you would be terminating in early April, and prior to soybeans, you would be terminating in early May. Now these results obviously can also relate to other systems where your termination timing would be similar. These samples were then ground and run through near-infrared spectroscopy with the appropriate calibrations for each species. The resulting quality constituents were inputted into the UGA cover crop nitrogen calculator. So if you haven't seen this, be sure to check it out. You can see it at the link here. But this is a really nice tool for providing a better estimate of how much nitrogen you're actually getting from your cover crop. So it takes in consideration the biomass, the percent nitrogen content in that biomass, as well as the proportions of things like cellulose, carbohydrates, and lignin, which can impact how that material breaks down and how quickly it breaks down. It also takes into consideration whether that material was left on the surface or tilled, which can make a big difference in how quickly that nitrogen is released. It also takes into consideration your environment, so temperature and precipitation averages. Now, unfortunately, they only have Georgia locations right now for their calculator, but fortunate for us, um, the Lafayette, Georgia location had similar enough temperature and precipitation that we felt pretty comfortable using that to estimate our Tennessee cover crop nitrogen. So this results a two weeks, four weeks, and 12 weeks nitrogen release. And for the purposes of this presentation, we're just going to cover that 12 week total release. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we had each of those three functional groups. We had species within the functional groups, and then we had varieties within those species. So we're going to start off by looking at differences in nitrogen release 
among those functional groups, then move into our species differences, and finally ending with our variety differences. So the reason cover crops are broken into these three major groups is because these groups behave very differently in terms of what they can provide in an agricultural system. So over here on the left, you can see a couple of examples of legumes. In the center, we have cereals. And on the right, we have brassicas. And these groups behave very differently when it comes to nitrogen. So the first difference we're going to talk about is where the nitrogen is coming from. So with legumes, these are nitrogen fixers. So they can actually pull nitrogen from the atmosphere to use. And then when they decompose, they're adding additional nitrogen to the system that wasn't already there. Cereals and brassicas, on the other hand, are nitrogen scavengers. So they're not creating new nitrogen, but they're keeping the nitrogen in the system that was already there. So when your cash crop is gone, if there's any excess nitrogen, these cover crops can scavenge that nitrogen, hold it through the winter night months so it's not going anywhere, and then as they decompose, release it back into your cash crop system. The second difference that we're going to talk about is in the composition of these species. So our legumes, which are represented here on the left, have a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio because they have a higher percentage of nitrogen in their biomass. What does that mean? Well, when microbes are breaking down that biomass material, they actually have more nitrogen than they need to process that biomass. That extra nitrogen goes to whatever else is growing around them, so our cash crop. Cereals, on the other hand, have a lower percentage of nitrogen in their biomass. That means that their carbon to nitrogen ratio is higher. Now, in some cases, it might be so high that those microbes don't have enough nitrogen to break down the biomass. And so they either are not going to contribute any nitrogen to your system, or they could actually pull nitrogen from other areas in the system. So this can cause a nitrogen deficit. So this graph really illustrates some of those differences that we see between those major functional groups. So here on our y-axis, we have nitrogen release over a 12-week period. Over here on our x-axis, we have biomass in tons per acre. In green are our legumes, in red are our brassicas, and in blue are our cereals. And each of these dots represents a mean for a specific location and species within our trial. So here for our legumes, you can see we have a very obvious trend up. So as we have more biomass, we get more nitrogen. So our higher, highest biomass yielders were also providing us the most nitrogen in the system. Our brassicas and our cereals acted very differently. So here for our brassicas, you can see it's, it's almost flat. So as we got more biomass in the system, the amount of nitrogen that was being provided didn't change all that much. Now for our cereals, as we got more biomass, our nitrogen actually decreased. And that's because as these things are getting bigger, our carbon to nitrogen ratio is going up, which means that the nitrogen is even less available. And you can see that this starts to go below that zero line. So actually we're starting to get into a nitrogen deficit as we get more biomass with these cereal species. So based on that previous graph, it's pretty obvious that our legumes are going to be our money makers when it comes to providing nitrogen to our system, which a lot of you probably already knew. So what about species of legumes and varieties within those species? There are, so there's a lot to choose from. Here you can see some examples of legumes that were in our trial. We have crimson clover, red clover, balanza clover, bursim clover, hairy vetch, winter pea, so a lot of different options. So first we're going to look at how much variation there is among those species. So I wish that there was a simple answer here and we could simply say that this is the best 
species for Tennessee. But what we saw was a lot of variation. So these graphs represent each of those different varieties within a species. So each dot is a different variety. They're color coded by species, and you can see this is broken down by termination month, either April or May, and location, East, Middle, and West Tennessee. So in general, our hairy vetch and our winter pea tended to be our top performers, but that varied by location. So this was primarily driven by differences in biomass. So for example, at our West Tennessee location in April, the clovers just did not perform very well. Whereas at Middle Tennessee and East Tennessee, they did fine. So what this graph really illustrates is how important it is to pick something that is specific to your system. So consider your termination timing, consider your location, and then find the variety and the species that works best in that specific system. Another thing to note is the overlap. So for example, if we take a look at this top bar where we have termination month April in West Tennessee, you can see those pink dots are our winter pea and the yellow dots are our hairy vetch. So there's overlap there. That means that some of these varieties of hairy vetch were better than some of the varieties of winter pea, but also some of those varieties of hairy vetch were not as good as some of the varieties of winter pea. So because of that overlap, it's important to look not only at these species and select primarily on species, but also to look at those varieties within the species because some of those varieties are going to perform better than others and may be better suited to your specific system. So now we're going to talk about variation within a species. So as an example, I've got here crimson clover, and you can see some of the many varieties that we tested of crimson clover. All right, so this is where it gets a little complicated because we did have so many varieties in our trial. So this table shows all of our legume varieties that we evaluated. They're sorted first by species. And then over here in the data section, you can see the average nitrogen release, as well as the nitrogen release for each of those specific locations. So West, Middle, and East Tennessee in April and in May. So really your go-to variety is going to depend on your system. So is it a system where you need to terminate in early April? Is it something that you can wait a little longer until that May termination? That's going to help you pick your best variety for your specific system. Also, whether you're in East, Middle, or West Tennessee may influence your decision as to which of these varieties is going to perform best for you. Now, looking at some of the varieties that did best across all of the locations and across all of the termination dates, they tended to fall, as we said before, in the hairy vetch and the winter pea species. So within those species, some of the top performers included AU Merit across the board, really good high amounts of nitrogen released, Patagonia Inta, Winter King, and then within our Winter Pea, Survivor, and Wyndham. So across the board, across April and May, and across all three locations, these were really top performers. But again, it's going to depend on where you're located and what system you're working with for your cash crop. So when you're going to terminate that cover crop as to which of these is going to do best in your system. But I would say look for those ones that are either light orange or dark orange because those are going to be ones that performed above average compared to everything else in the trial. So I want to talk very briefly about differences among and within species for cereals. Now, I know cereals are not our go-to for nitrogen, but a lot of people are putting cereals in their mixes. And so it's important to understand how they're impacting your nitrogen, if that's what your, your goal is, is to have more nitrogen in your system. So the first thing to note is this scale here. So our legumes, we went from 0 to 120 pounds per acre on our graph. 
here for our serials, we're at negative 10 to 10. And that's a big part of why I want to talk about this, because we do have the fact that we are going negative on this scale. So in our April month, you can see most of these species were pretty tight in terms of the variety performance. So within five pounds per acre. We did have a few of those cereal rise that were causing a deficit even in April, but for the most part, everything was giving a slight credit. Once you move into May though, you can see that variation starts to stretch a bit. So we do get more variety differences within species. And really we're starting to see more of a deficit among many of these species, in particular, that cereal rye. Now, if your goal is nitrogen, most of you are not planting a monoculture of a cereal, but a lot of people are planting mixes of cereals and legumes because these two can complement each other in terms of the benefits that they provide in an agricultural system. An important thing to remember though, if your goal is nitrogen, is that what you plant is not necessarily what you terminate, and what you terminate is what helps you determine how much nitrogen you're going to get. So this is some interesting research out of Georgia. So these graphs over here show the proportion of their cover crop mix according to species at the beginning of the season, and then how that progressed towards the end of the season. So each of those species is a different color. And an important one to look at is that green, and that's our cereal rye. So even when their cereal rye was only 20% of the mix at the beginning of the season, it tended to dominate by the end of the season. So if you're planting something with the expectation that 80% of your mix is going to be a legume, and at the end of the season, only 20% of your mix is a legume, and the rest is a cereal, that we're not getting a lot of nitrogen from, that can really throw how much nitrogen you potentially could have from that cover crop. So if your goal is nitrogen, an important thing to remember is to lower those rates of cereals in the mix if you want those legumes to be able to really perform and deliver a high amount of nitrogen at the end of the season. Okay, so in summary, we saw some big differences in nitrogen potential between those groups, legumes and cereals. So those legumes up to 117 pounds per acre of nitrogen. And the more biomass you had, the more nitrogen you had. With our cereals, we only got up to at most 13 pounds per acre of nitrogen, but we also had deficits potentially. And with the cereals, the more biomass you had, the less nitrogen you had. So really, if you are wanting to maximize the amount of nitrogen you're getting from these cover crops, then first and foremost, you need to make sure those legumes are the majority of your mix or plant a monoculture of a legume. Now we did see big differences both among species and within species, and those differences differed by when we terminated and they differed by location. So when it comes to selecting the best variety, it's important to consider the specifics of your system. So when do you plan to terminate? What location are you at? Because those things are going to help determine which variety is going to work best for you. So there were several varieties within the trial that did well across locations and across termination dates. These included AU Merit, Patagonia Inta, Winter King within the Hairy Vetch, and Survivor and Wyndham within the Winter Pea. So no matter where you planted or when you terminated, these were top performers. Now, does that mean that those are your only options? Absolutely not. So there were many varieties that were really top performers and provided a whole lot of nitrogen, but it was at a specific location or a specific termination timing. So over here on the right, you can see Kentucky Pride. It did very well at our Middle Tennessee location. It did not do very well at our East Tennessee location. So when you're going through these variety test results and looking for those top performers, be sure to think about the specifics of your system. Where are you located? 
When do you plan to terminate? Because those things can impact which variety is going to perform best for you. So what comes next? Well, we're doing it again. So our cover crop variety trial for 2021 is in the process of being packaged and will be planted within the next week. Now this year we are doing things a little bit differently in that we are having both an early planted trial and a late planted trial. And the reason for this is because we have different types of cash crop systems and depending on what you're planting your cover crop after, you may not be able to get that cover crop in as soon as you'd like. So some people, particularly people who are going in after something like soybeans or cotton, uh, they may have to plant those cover crops a little later. So we want to make sure that we provide information about which varieties are going to work best under those conditions as well, because it can vary a lot. We're also including some mixes this year. So we saw in that last slide how particularly cereal rye can dominate some of those mixes. So we are taking some of our top performers from last year, our AU Merit Harry Vetch, which was a really across the board great performer. And then our Bates RS4 cereal rye. And we're gonna do some mixes with those as well as mixing our top performing legumes with a less aggressive cereal rye, a less aggressive species, which is uh, a wheat, and then also looking at a reduced rate of cereal rye. All right, so again, just as a reminder, if you'd like to take a look at that publication or download any of the Excel files, those can be found at search.utcrops.com. Just go to the cover crop icon. And then we'd like to acknowledge all of our participants. So the folks that provided us seed to include in this trial, which were Grassland Oregon, Green Cover Seeds, Mountain View Seeds, Noble Foundation, Orogrow, Pennington Seed, Smith Seed, and Virginia Tech. And the varieties associated with each of those seed sources can be found in that publication, as well as all of the people who helped collect data and plant and harvest these trials. And then of course, the Tennessee Soybean Promotion Board that helped provide some of the funding to execute these trials this past year. So one of the great things about a field day is that you get to stretch your legs and actually go and look at some plots. Now, unfortunately, we can't do that today in person, but we can take you on a virtual tour of these plots. And one of the benefits of this field day being virtual is that you can take a look at these plots back in May when they were really at their peak. Now, we did this for the Milan no-till presentation as well, but there have been a few changes in the field tour, so I'll explain that a bit more on the next page. So we're going to go through each of our plots. These are sorted in the same order as our publication. So by species and then by variety within species. So the big picture is what that plot looked like in May. And you can see information about the group that it's in, the company that submitted that seed, the species and the variety on that sign there. This picture in the lower right hand corner is what that plot looked like back in November. Because some of these species, when we get to things like the brassicas, they're really not going to look that great in May because our goal for a brassica cover crop is not necessarily biomass in the spring. A lot of the times the benefits from those brassica species are more visual in the fall because they're providing a good amount of cover. Now up here in the top right corner, you can see the data for that variety for biomass, cover, and height, and then compare that to the trial average. I've also added in the nitrogen information, so you can see the nitrogen content in that variety in April and May, and then also how much nitrogen it would release over a 12-week period. And here we're not going to compare it to the trial average because really that would be comparing apples to oranges, looking at legumes versus cereals and brassicas. So we're just gonna look within group. So comparing that nitrogen content and nitrogen release 
for that specific variety and comparing that to the average across the group. So for example, this fixation clover is within the legume group. So we're gonna compare the nitrogen release from that variety to the overall nitrogen release within our legume group. So with that, I'm gonna leave you to take a look at each of these plots.
Thank you.